Thanks so much for joining me this afternoon uh, for the Cash Flow Made Easy. My name is Christy Bailey. I'm going to run through this webinar with you today. Um, my business is 180 Marketing and I'm a presenter and a trainer um, and a business advisor on behalf of Business Station as part of the ASPAS program. So thanks so much for joining the program. It's fantastic to have you on board and joining this webinar. Um, my business 180 Marketing focuses on strategic marketing for small businesses. I am also an owner of two small businesses. So uh, what I'm going to go through to, with you today is all about cash flow, specifically for uh, small businesses. I'm not an accountant and I'm not a bookkeeper. So my experience really comes from the operational side of owning and operating a small business. Um, I want today to be as interactive as possible. So um, if you do have any questions at any time, please feel free to type them into the Q&A box. I will see them pop up on my screen. So I will do my best to answer them straight away. Uh, we will also have some time at the end of the session that you can um, pop in some questions and I'll stay around to answer those then as well. So at any time, if you've got any questions, please feel free to, um, to drop them in and hopefully I can answer them then and there. Um, all right, so we'll get started. Uh, in terms of cash flow, everyone will be at sort of different levels of experience with cash flow. Some people may have um, have a, a cash flow forecast and be actively managing their cash flow, whereas others might not be aware of what cash flow even is. So in the webinar today, we're going to gain an insight into the cash flow, what it is, um, the cash flow process itself, and how you can manage it. So hopefully by the end of the session, you'll discover the difference or perhaps even the relationship between profit and loss and cash flow, and you learn how to create your own cash flow forecast if you don't already have one, um, as well as learn how to develop more of an analytical approach to cash management um, by effectively tracking your performance. So towards the end of the session today, we'll look at strategies to stretch your cash flow further, which is really a key element of what small businesses need to and want to want to do. So we've got quite a lot in store today in a short period of time. So um, this will be recorded and sent to you afterwards as well. So keep that in mind. Sorry, getting started. What is cash flow? Well, cash flow is the term that's used to describe an amount of cash as in your actual dollars that's generated or consumed in a given time period. So it has many uses both in operating a business and in performing a financial analysis. So it's one of the most important metrics in all of finance and accounting, in my opinion, because it really is the lifeblood of the company. It really allows you, analyzing your cash flow, allows you to elevate the flow of funds in the business um, at times that you might need to and identify when and where there could be or there are potential problems. Um, understanding your cash flow is really the key, in, again, in my opinion, to your business success. So if you can find out how to manage it, then you can really work out how to stretch it further as well. Now, the, the question of cash flow sorry, versus profitability um, is a, a question that always gets answered. And what is the difference? Now, the a profitability is the ultimate goal when it comes to the financial side of running a business. Um, you don't generally determine true profitability until the end of a period of time. So, for example, the end of a financial year, you'll look back at your P&L, your profit and loss, and determine if you were profitable. So this is really the key difference between cash flow and profit. Profit looks backwards, whereas cash flow, we're projecting and we're looking forwards. So profit indicates the amount of money that's really left over after all of your expenses have been paid. So like I said, at the end of a financial year, you can look at P&L on a shorter time period. It might be monthly, quarterly, um, however you want to look at that, but it is backward looking. Making a profit means that you've got enough sales of your product or service to cover all of your existing costs or expenses, and hopefully there's a little bit extra to spare, which becomes your profit. Um, cash flow really indicates the net flow of cash that comes in and out of your business at any particular time. So it could be, like I said, could be outlined in weeks, months, or years, and that's all entirely up to you. So when we get into forecasting, we'll, we'll look at that. I personally like to look at cash flow um, on a monthly basis, and obviously forecasting for at least 12 months in advance, but some people like to do that on shorter periods of time. Why cash flow matters? Uh, well, cash flow does matter and it matters a lot. So having good positive cash flow means that you'll have enough money to pay all of your expected expenses. Obviously, you need to pay them when they're due. So that's another key element of cash flow. 
Uh, but you also and, and know when you're able to reinvest in the business and potentially purchase capital if the capital is needed or any other assets that you might need to grow your business or even to run it more efficiently. So analyzing and knowing your cash flow, it means that you'll be able to see when it's appropriate to even return money to your shareholders if there are other shareholders in your business or take money out for yourself. Um, you'll know that you've got a buffer to cover you against future financial challenges, which is another key element of cash flow. Uh, there could be things that pop up that are unexpected. It could be equipment that needs to be replaced. Um, it could be legal expenses. It could be a high uh, uh, maintenance issue um, or anything else unforeseen. So things do pop up. And the key thing is that you're knowing that you can cover them. Um, you can't forecast uh, things like that to pop up, but knowing that there is cash left over or doing things about it if there's not, um, to know that you can cover those things. Now, you need to keep in mind that you can have profitability yet suffer from cash flow problems because it's all about timing. So if you've got clients that pay late or if you've got bad paying terms, so you have to pay early clients that pay late, then you're paying early to suppliers. Um, it, it leaves a gap. You're the one that's caught in the middle and without cash at particular time. So cycle and these payment terms are the first things that we'll look at today and that you should look at to keep your cash flow positive. So if you've got an existing business, it's important to continually do this. So this isn't something that you do once and then leave and sort of forget about. This is something that you continually analyze. Um, if you're a startup um, and looking at from that point of view, your first goal has to be making sure that the business starts with a positive cash flow. And once that's under control, of course, um, the ultimate final goal would be making it as profitable as possible. But this continual analysis is a real key element of cash flow. Now, in terms of tracking cash flow, tracking cash flow really allows you to operate profitably. Um, and to generate positive cash flow, otherwise making necessary changes to improve the cash flow. For example, you might identify that you need to reduce certain expenses or increase re revenue in particular areas at specific times. So there might be then promotions um, that you need to do or things that you need to cut out of your, your regular um, services that you undertake. Um, it really allows you to, to look at what's working and what's working well and what's not, of course. You can then set budgets based on what you know you need to achieve at certain times and then track it against your budget to make sure your cash flow is matching your budget, your budget's achieving the goals that, um, that the business has set out to achieve. Um, if you've got enough cash, um, then you might not have to put input any personally, but if not, and if you've identified specific times, you might need to put money in personally or seek investors or even sell assets. So we'll look at some of those things um, towards the end of the webinar today as to what you can do if there are any cash deficiencies. The big thing about tracking your cash flow is that it allows you to make some really informed decisions on various areas of your business and that could include purchasing staffing, how many staff you um, are engaging or that you're rostering, your sales and what level of sales uh, you need to achieve, leasing, um, equipment or um, space, renting space, so all of those things you need to be able to, they're long-term commitments, you'll be locked into contracts and that kind of thing. So you need to have a long-term vision, not just knowing what cash is in the bank at a particular time. And if you've got all of that knowledge, you're monitoring it continually, then you should be able to reach your business goals. Now, in terms of creating a forecast, well, we know just from what I've said now, hopefully um, within your business, you know that cash flow does matter and it matters a lot. So it's only natural that we'll do everything in our power to increase it. So forecasting and knowing exactly when you have these inflows and outflows is absolutely crucial. Um, and to be able to do that, we have to map it all out. So creating a cash flow forecast. There's a lot of different templates available online. Uh, there's some great templates available through Australian government websites and banks also have templates generally in an Excel format um, that are downloadable normally for free and that you can edit and make your own, uh, adjust and, and um, really just tailor it to what suits your specific business operations. Once you've got your template, the first or the starting point would be to decide the period that you're going to forecast for um, I would 
recommend looking at a 12 month period you might work on shorter cycles so a, a three month cycle but 12 months allows you to see any peaks and troughs seasonality changes that kind of thing so i think 12 months is reasonable and generally doing that on a monthly basis works really well but again your business might change week to week depending on what's going on so uh, have a look at what's suitable for you i think you'll find the last the large majority sorry of templates are based on monthly um, and a 12 month period um, for existing businesses you've got all the data from previous years so i would recommend when you are going to create a forecast obtain all of that data whether that's from your accounting system or from your accountants or bookkeepers um, and then use that data to input into your forecast so that you know you can basically judge what you've spent in the past from expenses and watch um, what revenue you've achieved in the past input that data as a starting point um, and then adjust it to suit based on any changes that you know start by estimating those outflows uh, going through any money that's going out um, having a look at your past information why it went out if it's a regular expense then it should go into your new cash flow um, and then in terms of that once you've got all your outflows input then you'll be able to look at what inflows you need which is how much you need to be putting into the business or how much revenue <clears throat> sorry you need to be earning um, sales figures will always change last year was a very different situation to this year in terms of whether um, businesses are open closed operating not operating seasonality there's a many many different things that could have changed within your business um, so keep that in mind when you're estimating inflows as well so on the screen now is an example of a template. Um, this is just one that I, I quite like this format. This is one that is available from one of the, the big four banks. Um, and it's a really good starting point. Like I said, there's a range of different templates, but find one that is downloadable as an Excel document, and then you can make it your own. You can change any of the information that you see on the screen now. So first of all, you would have to input an opening bank balance, which is cash that you have in the bank at that given time. And then your first month is going to be the month that you're in or the very next month. Um, input that first, and then you can start to add your inflows and your outflows into that template. So your inflows in terms of up the top here, you can see that it uh, says receipts. Um, and under receipts, it's sales and other revenue. So keep in mind, you are inputting the information here when you're actually getting the cash. So if you have debtors that don't pay you for 30 days and you know that your biggest sales or you know the sales incurred in July, but you won't get paid to August, it's a, think of it as a receipt. So that cash then gets put into the August um, statistics here on this template. So uh, factor in in your inflows, which is the small part at the top, sales, any GST rebates or tax refunds. Um, think about any investments of cash uh, that you might be or any owners might be putting into the business to add extra equity. Think about government or other grants and, or any kind of funding. Um, think about if and when loans uh, are paid back, if you've got any anybody that's owing you money or if you're planning on selling an asset, that would all go into the inflow. Other sources like royalties, you might have franchise fees or license fees or any other incoming funds would go in that top six, sorry, that top section there. The second part of this is the outflows. Um, so you can see under receipts um, in the grey line, it says less payments. Now there's a few examples in there, material stock packaging, and then you've got overheads, your accounting, bank fees, cleaning, et cetera. This, like I said, it's just a template, it's an example. So go through all of your expenses and input what you've got in here. But think about uh, what you're going to input here is any, all and any running expenses. Um, also think about if at any point you need to buy new assets, if you've got a planned purchase. Um, if you have any one-off bank fees, like there could be a loan establishment fee or something like that, annual fees for anything, um, licensing fees, keep that in mind. Um, also factor in any payments to yourself if you're the owner or to any owners in here as well, because we want to plan those out. So working with the cash flow forecast, it's not just a matter of, okay, we've got some cash in the bank, I might take some out now. It's planning it so that you know that you can actually afford it and seeing the impact that it has on this cash flow forecast. 
So don't forget to account for GST payments, obviously in your expenses. And remember, if you've got employees, factor in your PAYG and your super, um, which may be paid monthly, quarterly, whatever uh, sort of setup you've got there with each of those, factor them in here. So they're all of those known expenses, um, you can easily pop into the template here and, um, and account for them at different times so that you can truly gauge uh, your cash flow. If there's anything that you happen to forget, um, it can really be detrimental to the overall cash flow because it gives you an inaccurate picture. And that's why we continually go back and update this, this template against the actual. So let's say um, right now we're in the month of March. March finishes in a couple of days. So I would get all of my accounting um, reports from either my bookkeeper, from your account system yourself or your accountant, and then go back and check against exactly what you have forecast here and highlight any differences. Uh, and then to have a think um, and analyze why there are differences. Were they expected, unexpected? Were your sales lower than anticipated? And how does that impact? Once you adjust that data, have a look at what it does to the rest of the year in terms of your cash flow. All right, so now we're going to get to the good part, uh, which is improving your cash flow. So once you've mapped out your cash flow and you're all set up to track it, you'll identify if you need to improve it. Um, I say if you need to improve it, but even if you do have a profit, I believe that there should be and could be ways that you can improve your cash flow. So whether there's a profit or a loss showing on your cash flow, um, we would go through or generally I would recommend that you go through this analysis process. Um, if there is a loss showing, then obviously it's absolutely crucial to go through and look at some strategies for improving your cash flow. Generally, improving cash flow falls into one of three areas. You've got revenue growth, um, which factors in volume, price, um, your returning customers, you know, pricing items, any marketing that you're doing, that kind of thing. You've got your operating margin, which is your cost of goods sold. Um, and also your selling and general administrative expenses. Um, and then you've got capital efficiency. So this is really just a question of how efficiently you're using your cash to operate and grow. And it looks at your uh, property plan and equipment and any inventory um, and talking about thinking about inventory management, buying efficiencies, that kind of thing. So what we're going to do now is go into a little bit more detail uh, in some of the main elements that falls within um, their recommendations or of these strategies for improving cash flow. Obviously, every business is a little bit different. So you'll have uh, different elements of uh, this table that you're seeing here that, that apply to your business. Uh, but first of all, we're going to start with pricing. So pricing is a really interesting one. I work with a lot of businesses. And when I first start working with them, I find that a lot of them really don't know if their pricing is right and if the prices that they're charging for their product or service actually covers costs. Um, or and then obviously covering costs is one thing, but being profitable is another. Um, they also don't really know which products are better or doing better than others, so which they should focus their attention on and what they should maybe, uh, maybe uh, move away from if possible. So thinking about your business, do you know what are your most or your least profitable products or services? Have you analysed that? Um, have you thought about how you can increase the products uh, that are most profitable and then decrease the products that are less, less profitable, profitable Sorry, and possibly even get rid of products that aren't profitable at all? Um, also think about how much time is invested in each of them. Um, and then thinking about what you're doing with your pricing, once you've set your prices or when you're setting your prices, think about how you set them. So are you setting your prices based on a cost plus sort of model where you know what a product costs you and then you just add a markup, a standard percentage markup, and that's your price? Um, or are you looking at your competitors and going, well, I can... Uh, my competitor sells this product for $50, so I'm going to sell it for $50 as well, ignoring what it's actually costing you. Um, and the third sort of area of pricing is uh, just looking at what the customer is willing to pay. Um, so each of those pricing strategies, so the cost plus, the competitor-based pricing, or the value to the customer are not effective in their own right, but you really need to look at a combination of those three elements to set pricing effectively. You can't just base your pricing on what it costs you plus a markup because it might not be competitive. Um, similarly, you can't just base your pricing on what the customer wants to pay for something 
um, or by what your competitor is doing because you might not be covering costs or making a profit. So you've really got to have, you've got to know all of the information and look at all three elements to determine what prices you're going to charge for your products or services. Um, you have to know what your competitors are doing, but you have to also understand and know your worth. So identifying your strengths um, as a business in comparison to your competitors and also your weaknesses or any gaps in what you're offering from a product range perspective compared to other people um, in your industry. And doing that research is gonna make sure that you offer a really good product or service that's superior, superior to your competitors. And if you don't already have that, then finding a way to create a product or service that is superior uh, to your competitors. So this goes back to marketing strategy, um, thinking about what your product or service is that's unique or different and what really sets you apart. And can you charge more because of that fact, regardless of what your competitors are doing? Are you confident and do you communicate your value enough to customers um, to be able to, uh, to charge uh, a higher rate? Or do you want to base your pricing on more volume and less profit? When it comes to pricing, discounting is generally more work to make or maintain a margin, whereas increasing the price means less work, fewer customers, but you maintain a higher margin. But doing less work and having fewer customers is great, but you have to make sure that you're getting enough to maintain that margin. Um, by increasing your price, you could potentially even cut out a market. So that's another consideration when it comes to pricing as well. And then on the flip side, if you decrease the price, you could attract the wrong market. So a really good example of that are um, some of the, the bulk buying sort of sites like Groupon and Scoopon, those kind of guys. Um, they sell your product or service at a really discounted rate. Um, you get next to nothing or you get a very small cut of what they sell it for so your price is really low you attract a lot more customers you could potentially sell hundreds of a product or service so you've got a lot of customers but are they the right customers for you are they going to be loyal and repeat buy or are they people that are purely just seeking a deal and they'll go to whoever has the deal next time um, they could be harder to satisfy if they're not usually a, a customer that would buy in, in your price range, for example. They might be used to uh, lower value products or services. So therefore, they might not be a, a good fit for your client base or for, for your product or service. They could be harder, harder to satisfy. They could spend less when they, they come into your store or when they experience your product or service if you're trying to on-sell or upsell. But the big thing with those kind of things is loyalty. Um, it takes us time and money to get a customer through our door. So to ensure that they're loyal means that um, next time they do come through the door, we've already spent the time and effort getting them the first time. So therefore, the return on our investment for their subsequent sales um, through your business is going to be more beneficial. So think about that from a pricing perspective, uh, but really know what your pricing, where your pricing is at. Um, as to whether or not you're covering costs and really laying out your cash flow is going to allow you to know that because you're going to see exactly what your business looks like at the end of any given time period or the year, of course. So thinking about volume, uh, obviously selling more of something is going to give you more revenue, but can you increase your volume overall and specifically the volume of anything that's more profitable? So determine your profit enhancements or ways that you can increase volume. There's a few different options, which you can see in the table that are on the screen. So the first one um, is selling your existing products to existing markets. So that's simply selling more and that's called market penetration. Um, and that's where your product or similar products already exist. So you're trying to gain off your competitors. There's product development uh, where you're developing new products for existing markets. So could you launch a new product or service or maybe through what you've identified in researching what your competitors are doing or through just tracking trends in the media or in your day-to-day, -day, you might have identified that there's a product that would complement your product range um, and it would also appeal to an existing market. So that's a, that's a good one. Um, market development is another uh, strategy to increase volume and profitability. Um, that is an existing product so you've got an existing product and you're trying to appeal to a new market so you're trying to develop a new market 
Um, could you broaden the scope um, to an international market potentially when you have majority West Australians experiencing your product or service? So think about that if you've got a bricks and mortar store, perhaps you could go online and that's developing a new market. So a market, um, bricks and mortar is one market and you walk in customers and then you obviously online is another. So that's uh, that's a good a good one. And that's um, obviously a lot of people are doing a, a huge amount of market development now that the industry and, and that um, consumers have changed so much. So we don't we do only have Western Australians in Western Australia at the moment. Um, whereas we're used to international visitors, people from the East Coast. So depending on what your product or service is, it might be that you have to look at de some, developing some new markets now. Um, and the fourth strategy for increasing profit and uh, increasing volume, which in turn increase profit is diversification. Um, so looking at a completely new product that you're offering to a completely new market. So could you spread into new areas? sell something completely different to your to what your existing core product is and then a, a, appeal or approach a new a completely different market with that. Um, in terms of volume, you also have to consider your sales processes. So what are they like? Could you introduce um, or are there any initiatives to better processes that would allow you to sell more, that would free you up to be able to sell more? Is there anything that's bottlenecking um, the process, the sales process for you? Um, and if you could sort that out, then you would obviously sell more volume. Um, can you increase advertising? Obviously, that has a spend attached to it, but to get more volume, you need to communicate to more people. Um, so marketing or advertising is another key way to increase volume. I'm thinking about salespeople as well. Um, do you have salespeople, people out there that are promoting your product or trying to get new customers and actively working on getting more people through your doors? Um, are they good salespeople? If yes, make sure that you have a good plan in place to, first of all, you have to attract good staff, but obviously retain them as well. The other simple things to think about in, with increasing volume, like I said before, repeat customers are an easy win because you've done the work and spent the money in um, actually acquiring them. So that acquisition is a genuine and true cost to businesses. If you get a repeat customer, um, you just you're simply getting them back. So you don't have that high acquisition cost. So a customer reward program or something that encourages that repeat visitation is a really good idea as well. That's all increasing volume. So the next area to improve your actual cash flow lies with your debtors. Um, a major and a really interesting ATO statistic for debtors is that small businesses in Australia um, are owed $26 billion at any one time due to debtors. So that's $26 billion that small businesses or businesses of any size don't have because they're owed or they're awaiting that money. Um, so that's a major, that's a huge statistic. Um, and I think it's really important that as a small business, you address any issues with debtors and try to reduce that, um, the amount of money that's owed to you at any one time. Now, not all businesses have debtors. Um, some are fortunate in their customers pay as they go, uh, but a lot of businesses will have debtors. So some ways to address issues with debtors are firstly, uh, to collect payments as quickly as possible. So that's a really key area that you can um, that you can get that money to you. So again, think about if your supplier is invoicing you, you're paying out your supplier, um, you're giving that, that product or service to someone, um, but you're not getting the money from your debtor for quite a while, then you're the one that's out of pocket. So that's an immediate cash flow issue for you. The other thing you could potentially do is invoice earlier. Um, look at maybe not sending things at the end of the month, uh, maybe looking at um, sending invoices straight away as soon as the, um, the product or service has been given. Um, the other idea is switching from paper to electronic invoicing. So that would allow you uh, follow up. Uh, services. So automated follow-up. Electronic invoices are so much more professional than paper anyway. They're easier to send, they're easier to store um, to and to reduce turnaround times basically. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, think about the more automated the payment follow-up, the quicker you get paid, the less time you'll need to input uh, or you, the less time that you will need to input uh, to get payments. Um, Another really interesting stat is that 
from, and this is again from the ATO, it can cost over $30 to process for a, a business, sorry, to pro process a paper or PDF email. Now there is a new um, ability to e-invoice. So I'm not sure if, if any of you have heard about e-invoicing, but compared to that $30, it costs roughly only $10 for e-invoicing. So e-invoicing, electronic invoicing is an automated digital exchange of invoice information directly from your uh, account management system or your invoicing system to the suppliers. Um, so there is some software there um, and it's called PPOL, so P-E-P-P-O-L. Um, once you're both connected to that same e-invoicing network, you can start um, using your accounting software and it works with Xero and a few others and you can send and receive e-invoices, e which means that invoice is automatically input into the, um, the debtor's accounting software. So think about that. That is um, a really, really good way um, to make sure that your invoices aren't getting missed, they're getting input and therefore getting paid on time or earlier. So in terms of uh, getting paid on time, look at reducing your terms. Uh, do you have 30 day payment terms, for example, and could you reduce that to shorter than 30 days? So we've already spoken about invoicing earlier, so not waiting to the end of the month, but then short, shorten that payment time as well. Have a look at reducing that right down and possibly even offering a discount for, for prompt payment or introducing uh, late payment fees, whichever is most suitable to your business. I think late payment fees, they can, that could put possibly a negative spin on things, which we don't want. Um, but the other idea is just to make paying easy. So offer multiple payment methods to your clients, make sure that they have lots of different ways to pay you, whatever is most suited to them. So think about those few ways that you can really address the data issue. Um, because like I said, I said with that um, statistic, um, with how many, how much money is owed to businesses in Australia at any one time. It's absolutely phenomenal. And it, the money is much better in your pocket as a small business than it is in someone else's. All right. Um, so another element and another strategy for improving cash flow is to look at your assets. So asset, this is fairly straightforward, but it's one of those sort of obvious things that some businesses neglect to look at. So think about if you can free up any cash by selling underused um, or unused assets. Do you have any assets that you've accumulated that are sitting there that are no longer required? Um, so if you can sell those unnecessary assets, it could increase your cash in the business. It could save you on costs like insurance, perhaps storage, that kind of thing. Um, don't gather things that aren't making money or that aren't being used. So keep that in mind. And that can be any assets from something small like computers and, equi and smaller equipment right through to vehicles um, and other major or larger assets. Also look at leasing to free up cash. Leasing is great because it smooths out your cash flow. So think about if that would work better for you to lease um, equipment rather than owning it. You remove the cost of maintenance uh, when you're leasing something and the risk of a complete uh, equipment failure. Um, so think about that. If it's appropriate for your business, it could be a really good way to free up cash and also just reduce the risk of any, un, um, I guess, unknown expenses popping up or unexpected expenses. Um, in terms of assets, the other thing you can do is look at refinancing or negotiating better terms with any existing loans that you might have or any other bank agreements that you might have. So make sure that you're always reviewing um, your, your loans, your terms um, and all agreements just so that you can ensure that you're getting the best possible deal. Um, it can be quite competitive um, in that industry. So I think, I mean, if you've been a long-term customer, uh, then hopefully whoever your finance provider is will look after you in that sense as well. But you do need to communicate with them and have a personal relationship with uh, those key people in finance. All right, expenses. So put simply, I think expenses decrease the amount of cash that's available to your business. Um, so what can you do to get those expenses down? Um, can you defer expenses? Uh, is it there anything in there that you could potentially put off or or even look at better payment terms for them? Um, could you rent a cheaper location if you're leasing space or could you negotiate a better deal with your current lease? 
uh, think about those kind of expenses. Um, and again, uh, it's probably, you know, you probably don't have as much um, buying power at the moment or leasing power, but there is a lot of vacant commercial space as well. So think about if there's somewhere that you could operate more efficiently from and it's potentially cheaper or try and negotiate something with what your current lease is to save on any moving costs. Um, would there be any cheaper alternatives to any of the expenses that you've got? And I think laying it out in that cash flow forecast really gives you a picture of where you're spending money. And you might be surprised if you haven't already done a cash flow forecast, you might be quite surprised at some of the things that pop up on a cash flow forecast. Um, and that's and when I say a forecast, I mean from using your previous expenses and inputting them into the new data, uh, to, into the new template, having a look at what you've spent in the past, you might think, wow, did I really spend that much on travel or did I really spend that much on software? And then you look at efficiencies. You can say, all right, over the period of 12 months, I'm spending X amount. I should be able to go to someone and try and negotiate a better deal uh, to do this if I'm looking at an annual sort of buy, if that makes sense. Um, so think about new plans, technology packages. Could any of the expenses that are listed on here just be removed? Are they unnecessary expense, expenses? Um, also think about when the last time was that you reviewed insurances and other business um, expenses like that, that you could potentially, again, get better deals on. Look at comparisons um, in outsourcing versus in-house staffing as well. Um, I think that's a really key thing to do and it can be really effective, particularly if you've got um, someone that has experience and skills within your business and they're being bogged down with particular work, which is stopping them from selling more or gaining you more revenue. Um, there could be things like bookkeeping, particularly with more automation, we've just spoken about e-invoicing and getting those invoices out quicker. Um, there could be ways that you could outsource small aspects of your business to free up your staff or to reduce your staffing costs. Um, marketing is another one or any other administrative roles really to allow you to focus on actually getting that revenue in. Um, outsourcing versus in-house staffing has huge benefits. Obviously, um, Wages are a liability, whereas um, outsourcing it becomes an expense. Uh, so that could really change things in terms of your business. It also means that you don't you don't have holidays, sick leave, that kind of thing um, for those roles that you might only have uh, shorter shorter needs for or smaller needs for, I should say. So keep that in mind. I think that's um, something in particular to look at. Uh, but looking at reducing expenses. Um, in total um, and on an individual basis and laying it out in 12 months, this is what I've spent, is a really good task uh, and a, a good exercise to do to just see where you're at. Now, inventory represents cash, in my opinion. So um, that stock that you've got there, no matter what it is, if you're holding it for more than, say, 90 days, it's going to cost you significantly. Um, so it's costing you in storing it. It's costing you because you've outlaid the actual money for whatever it is, and it's losing value the longer it sits there. So in terms of your inventory, first of all, think about whatever you're purchasing. Could you source something cheaper, whether it's stock or materials? Um, review the pricing from your current suppliers and do that regularly. So whether you're getting a comparison uh, quote from another supplier or if you're going to your existing supplier and saying, look, over the last 12 months, I've purchased X amount. What can you do for me? Or can you do a better price? Or just doing some comparisons, then going back to your original supplier and saying, look, I can get this for cheaper elsewhere. Can you match the price and seeing what they can come up with? Also, when I, like I was saying, with um, looking at how much you've purchased over 12, a 12 month period, maybe that gives you a bit more buying power. So one, when you know exactly what you would consume or what you would purchase from an inventory perspective over a 12 month period, maybe you could then go back to your supplier and say, hey, this is what we're doing. Yes, we're doing it in short bursts, but we're doing it um, X amount of sales over a 12 month period. Um, think about if there is a way to give you a bit more purchase power. Also have a look and map out how much um, stock you use and how much cash you have on hand and see if there's times where it would be better for you to purchase. So let's say in February is your biggest cash month. Uh, gen generally, it's your biggest cash month. 
and you know that you will reorder stock in February, but also in July and then September, maybe you could do the big stock purchase in February, get a better price for the inventory or the stock that you're purchasing. Um, and then it lasts you over a couple of months, but it doesn't impact your cash flow because you know you have the cash. So this is another benefit to mapping it out, but it's a good way to look and see if there's any efficiencies there as well. Um, also think about um, the movement of your stock and tracking that. Have you got processes in place to identify when new stock should be ordered um, or returning anything that's unsold? I think the key here is really knowing your supplier's return policies. Um, so thinking about what or what their return policies are, do they allow you to return anything? If not, maybe try and source supplies that have more flexible return policies. Otherwise, think about how to move your stock faster. Um, that's a really key thing is moving it faster. Maybe you've got a bricks and mortar store and you want to go online as well to try and move that stock um, or using software to manage, manage the stock. Um, is helpful as well. Also having a look at what's not selling and replacing that slow moving stuff uh, with stock that does turn over faster because it's going to be much better for your cash flow to turn that stock over faster. So knowing what sells well and what doesn't sell at all is really, really important. Um, just in time stock orders or drop shipping, you, might, you may be familiar with those terms. Uh, they could be good ways to reduce inventory costs as well. So there could be suppliers that provide you with stock only when you need it. So a customer makes an order um, and that stock comes from them at that point. So it's not sitting in your warehouse or storeroom or anything like that. The only thing that you would be concerned with there is delays on delivery. Obviously, if you've got the stock on hand, um, it's a lot easier to give it to your customer or get it to your customer if there's any delays from a supplier um, that could impact your customer service. Um, also, the last tip here with inventory is to really use your supplier terms. So if they have a 30-day payment term, pay at 30 days. Don't pay early um, because it equates essentially to an interest-free loan if you're sitting on that money as opposed to them. Don't pay late, but I wouldn't recommend paying early either. Just really make use of whatever those terms are. And again, you might like to uh, choose your supplier based on their terms. So do a comparison of what they've got to offer, what their payment terms are, um, what their return policies are, all of those things and make your decision, uh, your, in your stock decisions based on all of that information, not just one component of it. Now, when it comes to staffing, I think it's a really key area that can be a major uh, expense for businesses. Um, in terms of staff management, rostering to cover demand and making sure that though that those rosters and the people that are on roster are producing revenue is obviously a key thing, but not overstaffing is the fine line. And that's really important as well. Um, making sure that you're tailoring a roster to peak periods, whether that's periods within a day, a week, a month or the year. Um, and then having flexible staffing arrangements in place so that you're not locked into particular staff at set times just because they need to have those hours. So making sure that you can really toggle your staff uh, rostering so that it suits your business. Being understaffed is a major problem as well because you're not able to service um, the customers and therefore you might not get that repeat, custo that repeat customer base or you could have issues in customer service. So keep that in mind. Um, but again, I mentioned it just a moment ago, consider outsourcing. Um, there could be specialist roles that you could outsource so that you're only paying on demand rather than having full-time employees in particular roles. It won't suit every business and it won't suit every role, but it's definitely an option. Um, also increasing flexibility of your workers um, in terms of what roles they undertake. Can they have multiple roles um, or can you employ those specific people that are able to do multiple roles or able to multitask when they're needed to? I think that's a really key thing, having that the flexible, having flexible workers really allows you um, to make use of them when you, need, when you need to in various areas of your business. So aside from them multitasking or having, or, you know, being flexible with you, 
think about your utilization of staff as well. Um, could you get maximum utilization out of them on any one time at any one time or shift? Can you set targets to maximize their productivity and the productivity of each individual? Or could you incentivize um, sales with commissions or some kind of reward for behavior that even improves your cash flow? So you could um, set sales targets, obviously. Um, you could, you know, give them a certain reward reward or a kickback if you're if for prompt payments by your customers based on the relationships that they've developed just keep in mind if you are paying your staff any incentives or commissions or bonuses or anything like that make sure that you're only paying them when you have the money so when you've received the payment from your client so again it doesn't affect your cash flow we're trying to alleviate cash flow issues um, not uh, impact them even more and the other thing is employing more qualified staff. So paying a staff member more uh, that's more qualified can really increase your sales and your customer satisfaction, which is a major part uh, of your cash flow. Um, that creates obviously positive word of mouth and then repeat, uh, repeat customers. So if you've got an unqualified staff member, um, it might look like a quick win on your cash flow statement, uh, which is fine. And it certainly would be a quick win on your cash flow statement, but how is it impacting you in the long run? So as an example, and one that I always uh, seem to come across is in restaurants. Um, now, I don't have a restaurant background, um, but when I'm being served by someone at the restaurant or when someone comes um, to tend to our table, I, you like to have a chat with them. I like to ask them a couple of things on the menu. You know, what's, you, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? And I think there's nothing more frustrating or disappointing than when somebody can't answer those questions for you or doesn't have the experience in engaging with you, just basic communication skills, or doesn't understand upselling or onselling. Another key, um, another key thing in restaurants is, you know, simply when you finish your mains, giving you the dessert menu rather than asking you if you want a dessert. So those little tactics um, that are real, really sales tactics, you know, a restaurant, um, a wait person may not think that they are um, a salesperson, but they absolutely are. And if you've got someone you're not unqualified and unable to do those upsell and on-sell um, and just really have those customer service techniques um, that allow a, a patron or a customer to spend more money, then you're losing out. So keep that in mind. Spend a little bit more for good quality staff and in return, your sales and your revenue will be higher and therefore your cash flow will be higher. Um, retention is another key thing when it comes to staff. Um, reducing staff turnover is should be a huge goal of every business because it has such a serious impact on the bottom line. Staff hiring and training is extremely expensive. Um, so if you can avoid those costs by being an employer of choice, that's the absolute ultimate goal. Um, once you've got those staff that are the perfect fit for your business, you have to do everything possible to keep them. And that's when we go back to incentivizing um, incentivizing staff and sales it really helps your business and it helps them and it keep it does um, impact retention as well so keep that in mind um, staff are a major factor in every business and a huge factor of your cash flow all right so that covers the main strategies to improve your cash flow and the key elements and areas that I think that you can look at um, to to make a positive change in your cash flow as you go through and complete your cash flow forecast, keep what I've said in mind, but then you get to the point that you've determined if you've got a profit or a loss and you'll need to make some considerations. Um, so if everything's looking positive um, and you are showing a, prof a profit, you have to really think about whether or not you want to take that out. Um, if you're too quick to take it out, you may not have any money to pay down debt or to invest back in to manage cash flow for future years or months. So I would be more inclined to not take it out and invest it back. Obviously, you need to cover your time and your costs and get a return on your business investment. Um, but just be careful when it comes to profit that you're not taking out too much at the wrong times. Um, if your forecast shows a loss, um, then you might have to look at, um, well, you're going to have to have um, money input. So would that be your own money? Um, do you need to seek equity from investors or do you need to perhaps borrow to fill gaps? Um, 
In terms of borrowing to fill gaps, it's quite common in business to, businesses to have seasonal cash flow issues. Um, so perhaps even speaking to your bank about an overdraft, if you don't already have one, that allows you, so basically through this process of your cash flow analysis, you'll identify when you do have times that you need an overdraft or you need some funds. An overdraft is great for managing cash flow and it's really, really common. So think about that. It can really alleviate issues, particularly uh, your own stress, um, and it will fix those um, those dead their cash flow issues, or it could be seasonal cash flow issues. Now, the very final step in your cash flow analysis, and the most important step, is to com continue to review your estimated cash flow against your actuals, like I said before. So make sure you go back and check what you estimated against those actuals for each specific period. I would do it as soon as possible after a period has ended. Like I said, if your periods are monthly, uh, at the end of March, as soon as you're into April, start looking at how much performed in comparison to your cash flow and reviewing where you're at. That way, if you need to make changes, you can do so fairly quickly um, and hopefully turn around the following month. Um, when you're doing this analysis, you can highlight those differences between what's estimated and what's actual. And then you, you, can, you can analyze essentially why it was wrong, where you're uh, or where, where it went wrong. Were your sales lower than your forecast or were your expenses higher? And what do you need, what action do you need to take to fix each of those? So keep in mind that cash flow is all about timing and literally speaking, the flow of cash. So when you're preparing that forecast, you have to be as accurate as possible on all elements of it. Um, so that when you're comparing the forecast to actuals, it all ties in and makes sense and you can make proper decisions based on what comes of that. There are some cash flow mistakes that people can make, and I know we've addressed quite a few of these already, um, but the biggest and most common mistakes that I see uh, is running a business from your bank balance. So thinking, all right, we've got tons of money in the bank, I'll take some out. Um, obviously, that doesn't account for any planned or unplanned expenses or even perhaps the seasonal nature of your business. So it's a massive no-no. Um, Improper management of taxes and government expenses is another area where um, small businesses seem to sort of get it wrong. These things are clear and they're known, so you can definitely plan for them. So whether it's GST, super, PAYG, um, there's penalties for late payments, but it's simple to account for them in, in your cash flow. So make sure that you do that in your planning stages and then you'll avoid any issues um, with that. Spending too much money on sales is also a big cash flow mistake. Um, small businesses need new customers, obviously, but you need to think about at what cost are they going to, are you going to um, pay to get them? So are you tracking that acquisition cost of your customer? Are you tra tracking the total revenue that each customer generates you? It has to be higher than the acquisition cost. So overspending on that acquisition or on your advertising, your marketing, whatever it's costing you to get people through the door, um, might lead to gaining a value, a small value customer. So you'll get that customer, uh, but no return. So businesses tend to have issues with that because they think the more customers they have, the higher the profit will be. So that's when I was talking about discounting. Um, you can attract a lot more people by heavily discounting, but until you know how much it's costing you and whether you can afford and at what percentage you can afford to discount, I wouldn't go there. Not forecasting is the biggest mistake, but we've spoken about that. Um, and hopefully that's really, uh, this session today has allowed you, if you haven't already got a forecast, to absolutely get one in place. Um, not collecting cash fast enough is another big problem. So if it's your customers that are delaying pay payments um, or if it's, you know, your supplier terms are too short, make sure that they are meeting somewhat in the middle. So your customers need to pay quickly. Your suppliers, you need to have, a longer lead time in terms of um, when you're going to, to pay them. Otherwise, you're going to be the one in the middle. So you're going to be the person giving the loan, essentially. Um, unpaid invoices are also cash flow killers, and they're a lot worse than late payments, um, and that's invoices not being paid, not being raised, I should say. I am continually surprised at how many companies I deal with that don't um, don't invoice for certain things. They just forget one here and there. I'm honest and I'll always let them know and say, hey, you haven't invoiced me, but it is that awkward thing of like, come on, how many times are you going to chase someone for an invoice before you just say, all right, it's their problem. So make sure you're not one of those businesses um, that aren't invoicing. 
all of your um, automated software is going to really alleviate any of those issues there. So keep that in mind as well. That automation has has many benefits and one of them is that things don't get missed. You don't want to stick a note on someone's desk and say, hey, can you invoice this person X amount? Um, you want that dealt with there and then, and the more automated you can be, the better. Obviously, um, as we discussed with inventory, um, holding inventory for too long is a major cash flow mistake because it costs you money. Um, inventory represents cash. We don't want it just sitting there doing nothing for you. So get rid of it um, or, or make sure that you're uh, really on top of your ordering uh, that's really the key message there um, and taking too much cash out is a big mistake and that's why I said right at the beginning when we're looking at the forecasting be planned make sure that you know how much you can take out and at what times you can take it out as well I think that's a really key thing is that you take that that money out um, at the specific time um, that it works for your business um, in terms of a cash flow don't just take it out when you see some money in the bank um, so if you've got negative cash flow, you can absolutely recover from it, but you first have to determine what's caused the issue. Obviously, and you do that through um, your forecasting, look at your payment terms, reducing operating costs, run promotions to get more sales or meet with the lender if you have to, but follow all of the strategies that we've uh, spoken about today to try and really boost um, your cash flow and reduce those expenses. Now that wraps up the session on cash flow uh, for me. So I hope it all makes sense and I hope there's some things that you can take out of this to improve or at the very least better understand the cash flow position that your business might be in at any given time of the year because I think that's the key message. Um, I'm going to stay on now and answer any questions that you might have. Um, but like I said, we're really just scratching the surface here. So if you do want to know more or if you want to talk about any other aspect of your business, you can always book a one-on-one -on -one appointment with me now that you're part of the ASPAS program. Um, you're more than welcome to do that, but please drop me a line now and ask any questions um, if you've got them. Otherwise, this webinar will be sent to you as a recording when we finish up. So thanks again for joining me today. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to share information on cash flow with you and I hope it helps. If there's anything more I can do, I hope to hear from you, but definitely pop in those questions. All right, it doesn't look like we've got any questions, so I am going to sign off now. Thanks again and um, have a great afternoon.